Hello, folks. I'm George Smart with U.S. Modernist Radio. It's a Friday night, and since Tom found out that I broke into his studio soundtracks to record the last bonus show, he changed the door code from 8675309, and he won't tell me the new one. Smart man. Fortunately, since then, I got a new mobile recording unit, so now I'm freed from a life of podcast-based burglary. Today's bonus show is from New York City, where I recently spoke with producer P.J. Latovsky about his new documentary, Neutra, Survival Through Design. Featuring historian Barbara Lamprecht, son Raymond Neutra, son Dion Neutra, who just passed away recently, Norman Foster, Moshe Softy, and of course, our pal, author Alan Hess, the Samuel L. Jackson of architecture documentaries, who has appeared in more movies in this niche than anyone. Alan even has his own purple lightsaber, I am told. Richard Neutra was one of the most important modernist architects of the 20th century. His houses are still highly prized 50 to 90 years later, and his legacy of incredibly beautiful and functional design is still wildly popular. I kick off things with PJ talking about his publicity tour for the movie. I you started, were in Europe, right? Yeah, I started in Vancouver and then went to... Uh, Paris and Berlin and Brussels. I started filming for some new films and then uh, Rotterdam Architecture Film Festival, which is great. And then Amsterdam and New York, Brazil, then back to Milan Design Film Festival. How many have you done so far? You know, it's going to be 10, but I uh, we got accepted to five other international festivals, but I was People who are smarter than me said, go for Locarno Film Festival. That's very important. Where is that one? Switzerland. Okay. And our film opens with the Neutra home that he did there, the Villa Bucerius. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, we got to go there and have a party there. But they didn't accept us, but we had been accepted for a New Zealand Architecture Film Fest tour for four cities, uh, Taromina in Sicily. Sicily, right and uh, Winnipeg Architecture Festival in uh, Arnhem, Netherlands. So I passed on all those to save our international premiere for Locarno, and then they didn't accept us. Oh, man. So we can go back to some of those next year. Well, I know with huge films like with the Avengers, you know, they're having openings in London and Tokyo and things like that. And and they fly this huge entourage of people. How does it work with documentaries? Do you have to get yourself to all these cities or do they help you out with airfare? Or how does the promotion side of it work? Um, it's kind of a mixed bag of uh some festivals will cover all your expenses and others will give you a couple nights hotel and others will pay transportation and pick, <laughs> you know, pick you up at the airport and a hotel. and Some, some will, will give you a little donut and a meal voucher. <laughs> and some will just give you some cash. You know, it's not as glamorous as it seems, but I do love meeting all these architecture people and uh, museum uh, historian people around the world. It's kind of a small community and a lot of people know everybody. So Yeah, so. that's very true. I've discovered that. Yeah. The movie opens in Switzerland with a yes. with this house you just mentioned. Yes. And then you start traveling around Europe with Barbara Lamprecht walking around talking. So tell us about her and the opening of the film. I thought that was very moving. Well, I had met a guy named Peter Rabbits in Berlin. No, Peter Rabbits, really? That's his yes. name? Okay. Yes. And uh, he used to live in Locarno, and his best friend there represents the Villa Bucerius. And uh, Peter had worked in Los Angeles with a firm, DZ and Penner, and I had met... Yeah, the real estate firm. Yes. Yeah. And I had lunch with Mike DZ, and he, you know, said, talk to all these people. And then I went to an opening at a DZ Penner office and was chatting with the guy, and he's like, oh, you need to meet Peter Rabbits. So I was going to Berlin for my last film uh, on the Russian director Tarkovsky. And uh, Peter took my proposal, printed it out, and brought it to the four Neutra homes in Berlin and put the proposal in the mailbox. And one of them called him and invited us over. 
So that kind of started it. And then Peter said he had access to the Villa Bucerius. And then I, when I finally met Barbara, I said, yeah, we're going to film there. And she's like, I got to go there. I got to go there. And then three other European Neutra homeowners were like, can we go to? Because nobody's really seen that house. Right. So having done the Tarkovsky film, he does like these very long one take shots. And I was like, okay, I want to get, you know, the Swiss Alps and the Lake Maggiore and then pan across to the Villa Bucerius and that that'll be good for opening credits and stuff like that. Is it fair to say that Barbara Lemprecht's one of the foremost Neutra authorities? Yes, she is the uh, Neutra scholar. You know, she wrote the Taschen book, Neutra Complete Works, which has a wooden cover. And uh, I've become very good friends with her and, uh, you know, Dion Neutra and Raymond Neutra. And, uh, you know, they all know each other. And Dion would kind of get a little jealous every once in a while because he's like, you know, she gets attention for knowing all the Neutra stuff, and I know more. <laughs> but we all love each other, so it's cool. <laughs> so for our listeners who are not familiar with Richard Neutra, tell us about his career and, and this incredible legacy of buildings he left. I know that on our website, we probably documented 400 houses of his. He was incredibly prolific, both on the residential and the commercial side. When I explain it, I, I say... Uh, Neutra was born in Vienna in 1892, when Vienna was the center of the universe of art, commerce, technology, medicine. Sigmund Freud, he was friends with Sigmund's son, Ernst Freud, and they uh, went to Adolf Loos's Bauschuler, which was a, I think, monthly, weekly seminar thing where they would visit houses and stuff, and Rudolf Schindler was part of that, too. Yeah. And... Uh, World War they, they One. Were, they were really the in crowd then. I mean, Loesch, he was like the guru. Yeah. He was the guy who got into so much public criticism for his buildings in Germany and Austria. And Czech Republic. Yeah. Yeah. So then they went to the Technische Hochschule in Vienna, the architecture school, and World War One broke out, and Schindler had left to America before that, so he was working with Frank Lloyd Wright. And, uh, you know, I find out all these minutia details of everything that happened and so at the end of world war one austria and america never signed their final treaty of the war so neutra couldn't come to america so he went to berlin and started working with eric mendelssohn which is when the bauhaus started so i tell people that neutra had a or day job and uh, so he wasn't you know going to school there but he did teach at the bauhaus briefly for like two weeks to four weeks in 1930. Okay. Um, so then Neutra comes to America. He stops in Chicago for under a year where he met Louis Sullivan. And then at Louis Sullivan's funeral, he met Frank Lloyd Wright. And Wright asked him if he'd work with him at Taliesin. So he went there for just a few months. And then he, he went to Los Angeles to meet up with Schindler. And then over the course of his lifetime, they designed over 500 buildings, homes, and I think 350 were realized. So. And uh, Schindler and Neutra had this interesting relationship. They and their wives lived together in Schindler's King's Road house, and then they fell out with each other. Yeah, I can understand that in my experiences of being in the rock and roll band and living with everybody <laughs> for, you know, I mean, five years is a, a, a lot of time. And, and the Neutras had their son, Frank, and then Dion was born there. So they were kind of, you know, raising two kids. And this Schindler house was kind of the center of creative uh, Hollywood partying back in the day. Oh, it was, it was a crazy salon for people in the creative class. Yes. So, you know, they would be up till two, three in the morning and Neutra would be, he, he got a job in downtown L.A. at some architecture firm. So he'd get up at four or five in the morning and they'd still be partying. So, you know, after five years, I'm sure there is some, you know, other things that we don't know about between people. But And there's a well-known story about the end of Schindler's life and his reconciliation with Neutra. Yes, Neutra had a heart attack, and he went to the hospital, and they put, and Schindler was already there, and they put him in the same room 
you know, the hospital didn't know that they knew each other or any of this history, so they ended up in this hospital room. And uh, there's a play about it now by the uh, UCLA professor. Uh, I forget his name, but I did see the play, and that kind of opened up some other things. Uh, but, you know, that's an interesting story. And then I have it in the film where Dion is bringing drawings and architecture boards to the hospital so Richard could okay them or offer ideas. So he saw the interaction between Rudolph and Richard and said they kind of buried the hatchet at the end and stuff. So that was, what, 53, 54? Yes. Somewhere in that range? Yeah. And Neutra lived until about 1970, I think. Yes. And he died of, a what, another heart attack in a client's house? Yes, he was at the Wuppertal Kemper House and uh, taking photographs of it with his photographer and uh, got into a fight with the Kempers about some payment, and then he had a heart attack and collapsed. And wow. I'd love to make the feature biopic and, you know, just because <laughs> it's a... It's a very interesting story of, you know, Vienna in the building of Los Angeles. When did you start working on the movie, PJ? It was about four years ago now. I was uh, had finished my Tarkovsky film and uh, was uh, on my way actually to Sao Paulo, Brazil for the premiere of that. And I, the Neutra Office Institute is now an art gallery. And I was there for an event and I met Dion and... Just kind of said, has anybody ever made the definitive Neutra film? And he he said, no, a lot of people have talked about it. And uh, what makes you think you could do it? And I was like, okay, well, I'll just... I did a quick two-page proposal on the overview of the, the story. And uh, so it wasn't like an exactly start up Monday morning at 8 o'clock and, you know, that you can time out how long these things take. But I was going to Berlin, so... And after I was in Berlin and learned about the Bauhaus and all that stuff. And people said, oh, you got to talk to them and them. And then I came back and I uh, got Thomas Hines' book, Richard Neuther. Right, and, sure. And the search for modern architecture. And my film kind of follows all the work that Thomas did. And, uh, you know, and I was like, oh, I got to interview those people. And I got to go there and see that house and... So the movie title, Survival Through Design, is not just a great catchy title, but it was also the title of an important book that described Neutra's philosophies. Tell me about yes. that. You know, this kind of gets back why I wanted to start in Vienna and his relationship with Ernst Freud and Sigmund Freud, because he read a lot. And so, you know, the whole psychology of design and stuff, and that, so Neutra was open to that. But the... Uh, real psychologist was uh, Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig who was doing experiments on, you know, how does touch and color and materials and uh, sounds and temperatures, how does that affect the human body and, uh, and perception and the built environment and stuff like that. So that was Neutra was always uh, considered that in his designs. And uh, so I touch on that in the film, but it gets really deep into the weeds on all, the, all this stuff. But over the years, Neutra was always writing and, you know, he was kind of a workaholic and stuff. So his book, Survival Through Design, is on this very dense physiological psychology. So if you see the film, it might be be more understandable. but I've always heard, and maybe you can verify this, that with his residential clients, at least some of them, Neutra was very meticulous about trying to assess their needs, even going to the extent of like spending the weekend with them. Is that true? Yes. He had a, like a form for people to fill out, like, you know, what's your lifestyle and, you know, how do you live and, and we'll design what it. What time do you get up in the morning and... Yeah. What do you like to do for breakfast? And really detailed questions about their day. Yes. And, you know, there's so much story in this 125-year history that I couldn't include everything. Some people think the film was a little long, and other people have said, you know, I didn't want it to end. <laughs> so I did think that was very interesting how Neutra was very specific on designing for the clients. They were all 
different, as well as the uh, location and site placement of the house and when the sun rises and sets and all that kind of stuff. What are some of the buildings that the public might see or, or know of that Neutra designed? I know the Crystal Cathedral is one. In Garden Grove. California. Uh, yep, Orange County. You know, I would always ask Raymond and Dion and everybody what's their favorite Neutra house. And uh, the VDL house, Vanderleo Research House on Silver Lake, they always kind of defer to that as because there was so much work that was done there. And uh, just meeting, experimentation, really. Meeting clients, and, you know, so it was always busy. And, you know, today Silver Lake is kind of the hipster neighborhood of L.A. and stuff like that. So. And you can visit the VDL house and buy tickets and tour it and, yep. and get you know, a guided explanation of the whole Neutra vibe, and it's a great tour. Yeah. And also the Lovell Health House, Thomas Hines said that he thinks that's a masterwork of modernism. And uh, Betty Topper passed away just in the past couple months, so. Yes, she did. We've had Ken on the show and Josh Gorell, who is living there now. Yep. So if you're coming to L.A., you should see the VDL House, the Lovell Health House, and, and I also say go to the Schindler house too cuz that's uh the King's Road house. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. It's you know this 1920s one story building and it's now surrounded by, you know, big apartments and condos and stuff. LA really loves Neutra houses. I mean, they fetch a premium in their neighborhoods. They're almost always restored. You don't see too many of them being torn down. That's in LA. However, there was the famous case this last year in San Francisco yes. at a Largent house. Do you know anything about that case? Um, they Somebody bought it and tore it down and built a, a new, I don't know what it was, but then the city came and said, you know, you're under arrest or whatever, and they had to tear that down and rebuild the Neutra home. I'm not sure where it is right now in the state. Let me see. I think I've got some notes on that. But Barbara Lamprecht is kind of... Following that, that, yeah. It looks like they tore down the house without a demolition permit. They didn't build a new one yet, but they were told by the city at one point that they were going to have to rebuild the old house in its original condition. This was a unique ruling by the city. Of course, the owner appealed, and it was overturned. And now he's going about, the owner's going about the business of building the house he wanted to build in the first place. Oh so God. we lost that one and lost the battle and, and lost the war on that. And it really establishes a bad precedent because if owners can just ignore the demolition permit process, there's no review, there's no preservation, there's, there's nothing. It's just calling the bulldozers. Right. Los Angeles is getting better and probably California as, as a whole on preservation of historic buildings, but, you know, compared to Europe, Los Angeles has only been around for 120, 150 years at the most, so. We're a baby country anyway. I mean, we've got to, we've got to figure out how to get our old country act together, become adults as a country, right? Right. What was the most fun for you in learning about Neutra and exploring his buildings? Just kind of the diversity and simplicity of his homes and seeing them in different locations. And I'm not an architect, and everybody always asks me if I am, and do I only do architect films? You know, I'm entering this next phase of the film uh, that it's done, so I don't have to carry equipment anymore. So I'm still learning about Neutra and Mm -hmm. things. What was the most fun for you? What was the most surprising thing that you learned? Um, filming at the Luchenwalde Forest Cemetery outside Berlin, you know, because that's, and Barbara Lamprecht says this, it's, it's not architecture with the foundation and a roof and walls, it's landscape. So it's a 60-acre site of rooms that are, you know, for specific graves and then the forest part where they're scattered and it's uh, just a very beautiful, peaceful, serene setting. And, and this was one of Neutra's projects early on? Yes, his very first one. His very first one? Yeah. And then he, because he went to Berlin with the Ernst Freud, who was going to get him some work, and then 
things fell through, and then he got this job as with the city of Luchenwalde. And so he was there for like six months, and then he went to Berlin and worked with Mendelssohn and then built uh, his first four houses in the Zehlendorf neighborhood. I know those houses over there in, in Berlin are really cool. We've got a few photos of them on the website. If you want to see more about Richard Neutra's houses particularly, you can go to our website, which is usmarnis.org slash Neutra. PG, I wanted to ask you about one of your earlier films, which I thought was really interesting, about your sister and her effort to walk around the world. She was the first woman to do that. Yep. Five years. Five years it took. Yeah. The Guinness Book has rules for walking around the world. You have to start and end at the same place and walk on four continents and at least 14,000 miles. Okay. So she wanted to go through China, but that would have taken longer than three months, so they wouldn't give her a visa. And then Pakistan and Iran, she went through India and Turkey instead. But So were you, were you with her along the route, or was this after-the-fact kind of filming? Um, I met up with her a couple times, but I had a, a real job at the time. And plus, you know, walking every day for 12, 15, 18 miles a day is hard work. Yeah. And most of the world is rural so was she taking photos as she went yes. how did she how did she manage to capture this and do it at the same time um, well she had a, a little video camera for the first leg through australia and then uh, a ton of photos and then i went back to interview the main people and that really helped her knew the story and and were there at the end when she walked back into Vail, Colorado. It was my first, you know, experience doing a very long feature documentary and international travel and the whole production and fundraising and and distribution. But, you know, that story is incredible. And now did yeah. she did the rules allow you to fly or do you have to get on a boat to you, do your travel? You walk from to the end of the continent and then fly to the next continent. And then, okay. and then she would go to the coast. And She walked for breast cancer, so she would mark her end-of-the-day walk with a pink ribbon and then go back there the next morning and start off again. Was it one of these deals where she got people to volunteer to put her up for the night? Yes. When she got to Australia, she met the Lions Clubs, and they kind of passed her from town to town, so... I mean, it's not expensive to walk, but, you know, hotels and food and everything can add up. But she's uh, really a go-getter and stuff. How old so, was she at the time? I think she started when she was 38 or 37. And, and five years. Yeah. You know, she tried to get people to sponsor her, and they were like, oh, right, you're going to walk around the world. And then so finally she said, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to do it, i got to do it now because she had to pretty much give up everything, her condo and uh, job and everything. So. Yeah, can't answer the mail very easily because you're in Australia. Yeah, well, she's doing good now. She She's in Denver and started her own self-publishing book company that's really taken off and does keynote motivational speaking. I bet. So. Now, is this film about your sister available anywhere? Can people see it? Yep, it's on iTunes and Amazon and if you... Google walk around the world, first woman or Polly. Polly Litovsky. Yeah, you can find it. A lot of other stuff. And when will the Neutra film be available for people to see, do you think? Um, well, if you're in Sao Paulo, you can see it Monday <laughs> night. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking to a few distributors and stuff like that. So that's kind of what this festival Festival yeah. Circuit is all about. Yeah, to meet people and stuff. Is there a website for the film now? Yes, neutrafilm.com. Okay, good name for it, yes. Yeah. Or just Google Neutra Documentary and it'll pop up. I had the pleasure of seeing the film when it premiered in the 2019 Palm Springs Modernism Week, yep. which was a great evening and a really nice thing for the film. It was fun to meet PJ for the first time, and, and Dion Neutra and Raymond Neutra were there with a lot of other Neutras. I think the grandkids and the, the great-grandkids had all come into town, right? Yes, the guest list, you know, was like, hey, everybody wants to come now. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So, but that was cool. 
you know, yeah. Matt Neutra, who's uh, the son of Raymond, has been also helping with some of the technical stuff. And he has a rich archive of Neutra material because him and his brother Justin, I think, filmed like 100 different Neutra homes. Yeah, I think, wasn't it Justin that was going to apply to film school and did a film about Neutra before he changed careers? Um, I've seen that film. I don't know. Yeah, was something like that school. rings a bell. Yeah. yeah. So. Anyway, PJ, thanks so much for stopping by. It's a pleasure to see you. All right. Thanks for having me. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to hear past shows, discover 7,000 mid-century modernist houses, and access 2.6 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Guest research led by Cindy Stratton, not a real name, an enigma to some, feared by others. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back soon with more quirky guests <laughs> and another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. <laughs>